So today we're making a boot scraper. And boot scrapers used to be ubiquitous back in the day when all boots had slick leather soles instead of tread. And the boot scraper would get mounted usually on your front step outside your front door where your guests could scrape the mud off of their boots before they came in. And um, this particular one is what we're gonna be copying. This is an antique. It could be 200 years old, I don't know. Um, could be less. And this one was originally mounted into stone. So it was probably on the end of a stone step and this much of the leg was in a hole in the stone and um, molten lead was poured around the leg to keep it stable. And uh, so this is wrought iron. Today we're gonna be using mild steel and we're gonna copy this best we can. And my starting stock for the side members is 5 8 square, 5 8 square bar, and I've made this pattern already. This is a pattern. Um, I made this, this was a very painstaking process, um, just going slowly and eyeballing to make this pattern, which um, it forms the upright. So I curled, I flattened and curled and uncurled the scroll until I liked the way it looked. And then now this pattern is something I'll keep around and it will be easy, easier to um, match the pattern straight without the scroll. And then I will also make a second pattern eventually that has the scrolled end so that I can match it. Today we have the boot scraper we can match, the original. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this. This is my bar of starting stock for the first upright. And I'm going to record um, the length of the bar. So this bar is 9 and 3 eighths of an inch long. And I'm doing this because I want to know when I'm done making this upright exactly how much 5 eighths inch square stock it takes to make that upright. Um, that way, when I make more of these down the road, um, I'll record all this information in the notes, the starting stock, size, length, everything, um, and uh, that'll, that'll save time in the future. So, nine and three eighths. That is our length. So we're gonna go ahead and adjust my, readjust my half inch tongs for 5 8 square. And uh, so back to the, while we're heating, on, heating that up, back to the, the recording this measurement. The reason I recorded that is because once I get that piece forged out of this, there'll be some extra stock left over. And I will estimate um, how much that extra is and subtract that from our nine and three eighths, and then that will tell me what my actual starting stock size needs to be. All right, here we come. Stick this piece of stock in there, clamp it in the vise, and then I'm just gonna make sure that the reins are gonna feel good. I'm gonna adjust these back when I'm done with the project. I have a pair of 5 8 tongs in progress. I just haven't finished them yet. So while we're waiting for the tongs to cool that we need to work on the uprights, we're gonna go ahead and make the blade. So I expect the blade to lengthen a little bit while we're spreading it and getting this taper from one edge to another. So I've cut my stock, which is quarter by one, a little bit short. We're gonna take half an inch on each end for um, the tenon and draw that out and that'll be the first step. So I'm gonna cut this apart.
It's a little small, but it'll work. So now we're gonna start spreading the blade, getting that nice taper in it. This is kind of like spreading a fro. All right, overall, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I would like it to have a little bit more curve in it. So I'm gonna heat it up really, really nice and hot, curve it a little bit, and then straighten the tenons out so they're in a straight line across. Alright, that's looking pretty good. I think the tenons are fairly well lined up with each other. Let's see how close we got on our length. That's actually about a quarter inch shy, which doesn't bother me, but I will adjust that on the next one uh, so that it'll be a closer reproduction. So the first step in making the upright is to draw out a thin flat portion for the scroll. I'm relatively happy with the way that that matches from here down. Um, now it's time to, to turn the piece around and work from the middle, essentially where that center punch mark, this area, work from there this way. So we're just going to straighten that out a little bit, turn it around and switch tongs. So one of the really interesting things about this piece that we're working on that will get scrolled into the upright is that there's really no like parallel lines um, in the whole piece. So it's, it's all like weird tapers. 
So it tapers from here all the way down and it's not a completely even taper. And then on this axis, it, it tapers to this point and then the taper reverses and it tapers again. So there's basically just no like straight parallels on the whole piece. Just makes it an interesting, really, really interesting shape to forge. It's not super difficult, but um, I'm, I'm making it more difficult on myself than it might otherwise be simply because I want to try to get it as close to the original as possible. If I wasn't trying to reproduce a piece, an original, then um, I could knock out the same idea, just not quite as exact, um, a lot quicker because I, I wouldn't have to be as exact. All right, so I did trim it off, but then it drew out a little bit longer than I wanted. So I'm gonna trim it off again. But I don't think this is gonna mess up our volume calculation because it is um, I got it a little thinner than the pattern, so I think the volume will still be spot on. And the bottom two and a half inches of this will be down in the stone anyway. So there's one, and now I have to make another just like it. So back near the beginning of the video, I talked about how I was going to uh, check and see how much extra bar I had after making one of these. So I started with 5 8 square stock made one of these out of it, and now I'm gonna measure um, what was left over, the waste, so that I know exactly how much 5 8 bar it takes to make one of these. My starting length I marked down over there on the wall was um, nine and three quarters of an inch, and this, I'm gonna say it was, uh, we're gonna say three and a quarter because I cut off a little bit extra after I cut this off, a little, a little nub of material. So three and a quarter inches, from nine and a quarter leaves us with six and a half inches, if I got that math right. So six and a half inches is our starting stock. So we're gonna take this bar and we're gonna heat it up enough to hot cut six and a half inches for the next leg of the scraper. All right, six and a half inches. I'm just gonna put my ruler up against the blade of the hot cut and bring the end of the stock to the mark. Now, I wanna point out how much I love a thin bladed hot cut because you get fairly square ends instead of a real um, angled end on what you're cutting. And you can angle the piece a little bit if you want more or less angle on the end of the piece that you're cutting. All right, so that's gonna go in the fire. So this is our starting stock. So that's six and a half inches of 5 8 square, that will get turned into another one of these. So that kind of illustrates how much material has to move. All right, so on my pattern, I have a center punch mark which denotes the top of the mortise. So I'm gonna lay that up here and I'm gonna transfer that mark Make sure these are all lined up. This is the top of the slot for the mortise, which will be 
where the tenon goes in. All right, set that aside and hopefully I won't grab the hot one. I'm going to use these tongs and get one of these in the fire and heating up. So our mortise is going to be a quarter inch wide and five eighths of an inch tall. I've made a drift, which a drift, so it's right here in the middle or about two thirds up from the bottom end. It is the dimension of the, the finished dimension. So it's five eighths by a quarter of an inch for about this much of its length. The rest of it tapers down and that's so that you can insert it into a smaller slot stretch the slot apart and then as the drift drives through the taper on the driven end the struck end allows it to fall free and i've just made that drift out of mild steel which will work fine as long as i move fast don't let it heat up too much and then to make the slot i'm going to use a slot punch so this is a punch made from either 4140 or 5160 steel and it is about an eighth of an inch thick or just under and i think this one is about nine sixteenths long and that's what we're going to use to punch the slot with so we want the slot undersized when we punch it so that it will stretch as we drift it out into a real nice clean hole so i'm going to stick the punch in the center mark, tip it up, tip it towards me. And one light hit, and I'm gonna look and see how that looks. Make sure it's nice and centered. And then I'm gonna cool about every third hit. And I'm going to drive through about two thirds to three quarters from one side. And then I'll flip the piece over and I will eyeball the swell caused by the punch. If you can see that swell, that tells me where my slot is. I may need to get it a little hotter. Oh, there it went. And there goes everything. <laughs> I should have set things out of the way. That's okay. So I could feel when the slug sheared. So there's our slot. That went quite well. I'm really happy we didn't get a lot of sucking around the hole. And, uh, but we're gonna, as we drift it out bigger, <clears throat> We're gonna dress some of that swell, not all of it, but most of it out. Now, the, that swell looks kinda cool too, and it would be cool to leave it, but because the original doesn't have it, doesn't have a lot of it left, that's why I'm gonna drift most of it out. So we're gonna stick that back in the fire. I've got this one heating up. It's almost ready fill up my water can again. That looks pretty good. Felt it sheer. Come on. <clears throat> All right, the slug is still hanging in there a little bit, but it's mostly free. There we go. All right, so now both of them are punched. My hole didn't line up quite as nicely on that one, but it'll be just fine. It'll drift out.
back in the fire. We'll check the other one. It's almost there. I'd like it to be a little hotter. That's coming along, but it's going to require another heat. The second one is hot enough for the first drifting. It's important to work both sides of the slot evenly. So you'll see me flip it and keep going. Ah, ow. That was a bad boo-boo. Okay, we're going to knock the drift out. Dress that up a bit. Let's see, where's the miss strike? It's right there. I don't think I'm gonna get all that out. We'll just call it a beauty mark. All right, once again, just like the other one, that one's gonna require Probably just one more heat to clean it up completely. All right, second drifting for the first hole. Oh, went all the way through. Now this is one of those do as I say, not as I do things, but y'all don't make a practice out of just grabbing your drift with your bare hand better to use tongs and I'm gonna call that done so now I'm gonna knock the scale off doesn't really matter up here because we're going to be bending that and all the scale will pop off. That is ready. That mortise is ready for its tenon. Now we're going to go ahead and finish the drifting on the second leg. This whole process, this part of the process, punching and drifting, has literally taken only a couple of minutes. It's a really frustrating process for a beginner. Once you've had a little practice, it gets a little easier, but it's still definitely a song and dance. All right, final drifting. And we should have a clean mortise. All right, so it is time now to make our scrolls. So in doing this, we're going to try hard to match or get pretty close to matching the scrolls on the original. So once again, this is taking a little bit longer because I'm trying to reproduce an exact look. I'm trying to match the original. If I wasn't trying to match the, ori or the original, I would just do one of these scrolls by eye really fast, and then I would just make the other to, to sort of match it, get close enough. But I want it to look really close to the original, although it's interesting to note 
that the scrolls on the original are close enough that you wouldn't notice any differences from a distance, but if you look hard, look close, they are significantly different, significant variances in them. But it still looks great. I'm going to call that good enough, close enough. The scroll has a little bit more twist to it than I want, so I'm going to fix that real quick. Stick it in the vise. Just twist it a little. That's good enough. All right, so we are ready for assembly. Those look pretty good, if I do say so myself. I think they look very, very close to the originals. So the next thing to do is to rivet the tenons in place. And normally, I would absolutely, definitely do this cold. I would uh, just peen the ends of the, rip, the tenon over cold, and that would be a lot easier. But unfortunately, I've got a lot of slop in my mortises. I made my tenons way too small. I got a little carried away with my enthusiastic forging. I should have made these pieces first and then carefully snuck up on my tenon size, checking them to the mortise. So I really like a, a nicer fit in my mortises. But we're just gonna go with it. We're gonna heat this tenon in the forge, stick this piece in the vise really quickly, come over the top, and then hammer the tenon down into it. What I do need to do though is I need to judge about how much of this tenon I need to get rid of, how much I need to, need to cut off. So that's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna estimate, guesstimate, and I'm gonna say that I need to take at least a quarter inch off of that tenon. So I'll go ahead and cut that off after I get it hot. All of this would have been avoided had I properly sized my tenons to start with. All right, I better quit while I'm ahead. holes are ready. I'm going to go ahead and level out the bottom of the stone the best I can. Looks like it ought to sit pretty good. <clears throat> now I'm just gonna rub this thing real good with some nice dirty blacksmith shop dirt. And then we'll brush it off and hope that it has a nice even patina.
All right. Now later on, I will kind of scrub the whole thing down with some water and let it dry, but I like that. I think it'll look good. Let's make these, make sure these holes are real good and dry before we pour the lead, because if we don't, it could explode out of there. Molten lead and wet water don't mix. A little bit of water down in there could be disastrous. This is much less than ideal here. I need a real deal cast iron casting ladle. Hopefully this flimsy ladle doesn't give out on me. So this step is called caulking, and it's necessary because the hot lead actually shrinks, and we want to make sure that it's packed in there nice and tight. Well, there she is. 